Coming up next, we have a conversation with Bill Ryerson and John McBride, um, and called Hidden in Plain View, Impacts of Population. Uh, Bill Ryerson is founder and president of Population Media Center, uh, an organization that strives to improve well-being of people worldwide through mass entertainment and media. And John McBride is a local businessman, rancher, and conservationist who came to Aspen in the 1960s and helped develop the Snowmass Ski Area, which is right out there that you've been looking at all week. So uh, take it away. OK. Can you hear me? I'm John McBride. I have uh, lived in the Roaring Fork Valley for 50 years, live on a cattle ranch two valleys down. Uh, we try to stay in balance with nature there. Uh, the number of cattle we run is dependent on the amount of water we have and the amount of grass we can grow and the number of wildlife that are there. Um, I've enjoyed this conference. I've heard a lot of good creative ideas to make the planet better, more sustainable. But I feel still very pessimistic because of the population crisis. When I was born, there was third as many people on the planet as there are today. And as the population changes, everything changes. It could be that all these solutions we've heard are meaningless if we go to 15 billion people. It's a different solution if we are able to stabilize things. I had a weird dream last night that this conference was a cake. And it was in the oven. And it was brought out of the oven. And it was covered with all kinds of creative frosting and ideas on the top. That's what was the conference. But what I was imagining is that the cake itself was the population bomb. And as it grew and grew and grew, the frosting was cracking and flaking and falling off. That's a crazy notion. But I think it's exciting that population is discussed at a conference like this, because we can't just leave a wild elephant in the room uh, and not understanding it. We may not be able to control it, but we have to understand it and the impacts it's going to have. We can talk about natural corridors or not, or E.O. Wilson and half Earth, but maybe it's impossible the way we're going. So I've been a long time uh, worrier about population issues. I used to be on the Population Institute board. I've known Bill for a number of years. I respect the work he does for the population communication media and for the Population Institute. He lives in Burlington, Vermont. Um, he probably knows the population issues as well as anyone. So I really applaud his work. Incidentally, you will see some pictures out of this book, which I think is one of the most extraordinary visual presentations of our population issue. And I encourage you to get a copy, or as I did, get many copies and give them to doctor's offices or lawyer's offices and what have you, where more people can see it and be aware of what we are all doing to the planet. Anyway, without further ado, the one that's important to hear from is Bill Ryerson. And uh, I think he will show you a number of pictures from the book. Well, John, thank you so much, and thanks to Chip for uh, including us and for including this issue in this extraordinary conference. Uh, John mentioned the book. Uh, there are three copies left in the bookstore next door, and at John's suggestion, we're going to show you some uh, photos from this book. It's got 150 photos of human impact on the planet, uh, so you'll get a sense of this. And in fact, we're going to start off this morning with a short video that uses photos from the book done by the book's editor, Tom Butler, who's with the Foundation for Deep Ecology. So if you could run that video, that'd be great. Lord Man, a parable. In the beginning, the world was whole and beauty prevailed, life begetting life until the waters, then the lands were filled with creatures. 
Myriad were their languages, from the nearly imperceptible song of moss to the bugling of elk. Whales performed their symphonies in the deep. The sounds of life were everywhere. Life pulsed and contracted and flourished through the ages. Eventually, a being appeared who learned to speak and count. For millennia, he lived well among his wild kin. But as his cleverness grew, so did his ambitions, until the day he declared himself ruler of all. Believing the self-deception that his kind was sovereign over the others, he taught his children that the earth had been made for man's use and profit. He no longer recognized his neighbors in the community of life, instead calling them natural resources. His work he named progress. The old religions, which had long tied the human tribe to the other creatures in a circle of reciprocity, were forgotten. Feigning himself Lord Man, he grew ever more clever. He learned to gather and burn fossil fuels made by ancient geological forces. Praise was sung incessantly to the new god, Growth. His numbers became multitudes. As the multitude spread across the face of the earth, the songs of the other creatures grew fewer and fainter. Many voices went permanently quiet, replaced by the sounds of machines, digging, churning, scarring the land, and driving the whales crazy with their noise. Every day, the earth grew poorer, transformed bit by bit by Lord Man's numbers and actions. The seas were emptied of fish and filled with garbage. The trees were replaced by bleeding stumps. The prairies were transformed into feeding factories for the ever-expanding human masses. Smokestacks darkened the skies. No place was sacred, no landscape safe from the insatiable creature's thirst for more energy to serve his god of growth. Lord Man tamed rivers, split atoms, decapitated mountains, and stabbed the earth everywhere he thought a vein of fuel lay hidden. When the feverish earth cried out, sending furies to communicate her distress, Lord Man ignored the growing sickness until it could no longer be denied. Slowly, the scales began to fall from his eyes when he saw famine ravage the land when he saw precious sources of fresh water disappear, when the longing that gnawed on his spirit made him recall so many creatures that had passed into oblivion. Seeing the effects of his hubris, he began to wonder if his empire was secure. His delusion weakened just enough to reveal the choice before him. Two paths one leading to an abundant earth filled with birdsong. The other, the way of growth, offered riches for some, misery for many, and ultimate destruction for all his tribe. Would he restrain his numbers and rejoin the community of life as plain member and citizen? Or attempt to engineer all the earth to his will, heeding only the call of more. So with that, thank you. Uh, we're going to run those uh, photos from the book while I talk a little bit about this issue, uh, which I've been embroiled in for over 40 years. Uh, Damien Mander this morning in the African Wildlife panel mentioned the difficult issue of population and said something along the lines of, uh, it's difficult for people to address this issue because of the ethical concerns, but still it's something that needs to be addressed. Uh, a few years ago I spoke at the Rotary International Convention when it was held in Salt Lake City. And uh, during a break in the uh, proceedings, I wandered around the exhibit hall, and back in one corner was the booth of the Rotarians Against Climate Change. So I went up to the booth, and the man 
said, uh, would you like our brochure about the 22 things you can do to address climate change? And I said, yeah, I'd love to have your brochure. And I said, I bet this brochure says that I should insulate the house. And he said, you're right. And I said, and I'm sure it tells me that I should change the light bulbs and put in low carbon, long lasting light bulbs. And he said, you're right, how did you know? And I said, and I'm absolutely positive this brochure will tell me I should limit my family size. And he said, oh no, you know, China and all that, we don't address the population issue. So I said, oh, okay, so you're telling me as an American, if I have 16 children with their carbon footprint, that's not a problem? And he said, well, all of this is driven by population growth, but we don't address population control. And I thought, you know, this says it all. Uh, so many people cannot get their arms around this issue. They, they struggle with how to address the issue. There are some who have done so very cleverly. For example, the Center for Biological Diversity uh, has put out endangered species condoms uh, to make the link between population issues and the threat to biodiversity. This one is a picture of a polar bear. It says, wrap with care, save the polar bear. <laughs> See me afterwards if you need these. Um, <laughs> also, they have one, save the burrowing beetle, cover your tweedle. And there, there are many more. But many environmental groups are terrified of this issue. Um, it used to be back in the 70s that both conservatives and liberals, Republicans and Democrats, unified around this issue. Now it's become controversial, and a lot of people on both sides of the aisle are terrified to address it. Um, however, it is an environmental issue as well as a human rights issue. So let me talk a little bit about the, the data. First of all, there are many people in the development industry that want this subject off the table and put major efforts to keep population growing because housing starts are their lifeblood. Um, recently in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, there was an article by two scholars who said, you know, from a climate and environmental standpoint, population should just not be even addressed because it's a huge battleship, it's way way too, or aircraft carrier even, it, it's too slow to be turned around uh, with the momentum that's built into the system with youthful populations. We're gonna end up at the end of the century with five to 10 billion people anyway, so why worry about it? And I looked at that article and I thought, five to 10 billion people, that's a very big range, and indeed they may be right. If we do something about it, it might be five billion. If we do nothing about it, it might be 10 billion. There's a huge difference there in terms of impact on the planet and sustainability. Um, Brian O'Neill at University of Colorado Boulder has done some really excellent work on the link between population and climate change. And in his research, he's published uh, the finding that if we make a major effort to promote family planning and small family norms, that will yield between 16 and 29% of what's necessary to avoid cl catastrophic climate change. It's not 100%, but it's not zero. And yet, in Paris and at most of the climate conferences, this subject has not been discussed. Um, the median projection of the UN Population Division for growth from now to 2050 is an additional 2.5 billion people. That's the climate equivalent, even though these countries, or even though these people live in countries with low per capita emissions of greenhouse gases, that's the climate equivalent of adding two United States to the planet. So it is important what we do about that, and the range between the low variable and the high variable is about the equivalent of two United States from a climate standpoint. Um, the cost of providing information and family planning services to achieve the low variable is one one-thousandth the cost 
of all the technological fixes that are being discussed. And yet, the US House of Representatives two years ago voted to defund all family planning domestically and internationally. Thankfully, the Senate stopped that from going through. Population growth in developing countries, as we heard referenced in the African wildlife discussion, is a major factor in loss of habitat. Human Expanding human habitation is a major threat to the biodiversity that makes the planet livable. And in many countries, they are way beyond sustainability. So for example, in India, underground aquifers are being pumped to irrigate crops at a rate much higher than replacement by rainwater. So the water table in India, in much of India, is sinking by 10 feet a year. Farmers are having to drill deeper and deeper to get that water. There are 200 million people in India alone being kept alive through unsustainable overpumping of these aquifers. Farmers are now running out of water, unable to reach them. Land is turning to desert. Farmers are giving up their farming. Those people face an imminent threat of starvation. Um, large family size is also a major driver of poverty. That is one of the factors involved in the bushmeat trade and other factors affecting uh, the environment. And yet, many people have no idea that most of what has been accomplished in the field of population and family planning has been done totally voluntarily. Last night, Rachel uh, Carrillo and I were talking about Michai Virabhadaya, a member of the royal family of Thailand, who undertook a campaign to popularize small family norms, use of condoms, vasectomies, etc. I attended his vasectomy camp in 1983. It's held on the king's birthday, so it became a patriotic act to have your vasectomy on the king's birthday. He had a program of giving condoms to policemen on the street corners, which he called his cops and rubbers program. <laughs> he just, with humor, took out all the taboo about the, this subject, and Thailand now, totally voluntarily, has a fertility rate of 1.8 children per woman. This is a brilliant social marketer. Thailand is now a middle-income country because of this, because the demographic dividend, smaller family norms, even with no change in family income, allows people to save a little money. That builds capital in the marketplace. That allows businesses to borrow and expand. That builds employment. That indeed leads to uh, growing economic welfare, and it allows uh, people to spend some of their savings on education, which improves economic productivity, and it allows the government to tax the rising incomes and build infrastructure. That also improves economic productivity. Every country that's gone from developing to developed status since World War II started with family planning, and all the Asian tigers have promoted family planning and small family norms. Now, we have made huge progress. In 1960, 10% of the world's couples use modern methods of contraception. Now, 56% do. But because of population growth, the 44% non-users outnumber the 90% non-users from 1960. So we have a long way to go. A lot of people assume that the non-users must not be using contraception because they don't have access to methods. But in fact, the demographic and health surveys now carried out in 95 countries very clearly show the reasons for non-use. Number one, wanting bigger families. In Niger, with a fertility rate of 7.6 children per woman, men want 13, women want 9.5. So building more clinics is not going to change that. Changing social norms with regard to family size is critical. After wanting larger families, the reasons given in the surveys are they've heard it's dangerous, their religion's opposed, their husband's opposed, they're opposed, or they think God determines how many children they're going to have, and there's nothing they can do about it, fatalism. So in fact, changing those social norms is 
critical. Overcoming the cultural and informational barriers is critical. And what our organization does, Population Media Center, is prime time radio and television soap operas, long running serialized melodramas, in which key characters evolve into positive role models for the audience for smaller family norms, for daughter education, stopping child marriage, use of family planning, HIV prevention, reforestation, and a whole array of other issues. Just before the Ebola epidemic in Sierra Leone, we completed a 208 episode radio serial drama at clinics during its broadcast. 50% of family planning clients named the program as the reason they had come to the clinic. In Ethiopia, with 46% of the population listening, married women in two and a half years who were listening tripled their use of family planning, while non-listeners had a slight increase. During that program also, male listeners went from 33% who thought it was appropriate for women to run for higher office to 66%. Non-listeners had essentially no change. So modeling behavior of all kinds is a key way to change behavior. In this country, we have a hit on Hulu. If you're not a viewer of Hulu, I encourage you to do so. It's an online network with 30 million viewers. You do not have to be a paid subscriber to watch our program, East Los High. East Los High is about the lives of Hispanic teens in East LA at a fictional high school, East Los High. And it deals with teen pregnancy, it deals with abortion, it deals with uh, obesity and other issues affecting Hispanic teens. And in season two in 2014, it became Hulu's number one show. I bought a copy of season one in Kampala, Uganda at a pirate video shop for 57 cents. And it was right next to Desperate Housewives and the guy selling it said, it's selling as well as Desperate Housewives. And I said, that's fabulous. In fact, on Hulu, it's out competing Desperate Housewives. And it's been nominated for five Emmys. So I encourage you to watch it. We're planning a new one uh, in partnership with the Harlem Children's Zone. Um, and we have just launched two programs in Nepal uh, to stop child marriage. Nepal has the highest rates of child marriage on the planet. We've done programs of this type now in 54 countries, and I won't go into all of that because we don't have time, but you can get materials about this work on the coffee table at the end of the hall if you're interested in knowing more. And with that, I think we should open it up to questions. Yes. Let, let's get the microphone to you. My name is Dr. Mary Schmidt. I'm an infectious disease specialist and global health, public health expert. So how do you work with the um, ministers of health in these countries? Obviously, you'd like to incorporate their program and their acceptance and their network into your communication. And then uh, on a side comment, too, I was very pleased that the Catholic Church adopted condom use for the Zika virus outbreak. <coughs> And so I'm wondering if there's any hope to the Catholic Church adopting condoms for polar bears in our future. <laughs> uh, we should get one of these to the Vatican. Uh, I was actually about three miles from the Vatican when I held these up to a camera during a talk I gave in Rome. Uh, but um, it, I have no idea with regard to what the church will do. Uh, I think the good news is Italy and Spain have among the, mo among the lowest fertility rates on the planet. So indeed, Catholic countries can overcome the obstacles that the church has pre pre presented. Uh, we start in our work in any country with the Ministry of Health. We create a formal document with, which is a policy framework. So we're not there to impose some outside idea of how their people should live. We, start with their policies, and the programs are based on their policies. The only policies we don't address are ones that violate human rights or that uh, counter UN agreements. Uh, and indeed, these are very much rights-based programs. So 
we're helping through the characters to have the population understand what their rights are. To give you an example, one of the letters we got from a woman in southern Ethiopia said, thank you for dealing with the issue of marriage by abduction. Our own daughter was abducted on her way to school and at age 14 and ended up married as a result. And we've been afraid to send the 12-year-old girls to school for fear the same thing would happen to them. When your program on Radio Ethiopia addressed this issue through the character Wu Balam, our entire village came together and agreed to enforce the law against marriage by abduction because everybody in the village was listening to the program and we didn't know there was a law against marriage by abduction. So now that it's being enforced, it's safe for our 12-year-old girls to go to school. Um, my name is Natalie Ray, and um, first I have a recommendation for the video we first watched. Um, it was very moving, and um, I recommend that a woman be the voiceover, and I think it would be even more powerful. I was close to tears. It probably would have thrown me over. But um, I was wondering uh, how, closely, how closely you guys work with Planned Parenthood in North America. Very closely. They're a partner on the East Los High Project, and... In the first month of this program, East Los High, that's rolling out f season four next month on Hulu, in the first month in 2013, 27,000 people linked from our program to Planned Parenthood's website. Maybe, thank you. Any other questions? I think we have one more, uh, Jana. Thank you, Janice. Six. I'm with the Prentice Foundation, and we fund population reproductive rights. But most people in this room are interested in other issues, energy primarily. And in energy, the low-hanging fruit is energy efficiency. It's the cheapest bang for the buck. Actually, family planning is probably the better low-hanging fruit for saving energy. So do you have any tips on how people that don't usually work with population could actually incorporate some kind of messages into their energy work? Um, certainly, I think it's worth mentioning in whatever they're doing in the way of communications. Uh, and it always needs to be based in a human rights context that, you know, if women are educated, if we stop child marriage, if we stop violence against women, um, and we allow people to determine the number and spacing of their children, as well as giving them information on the health and welfare benefits of smaller family norms, this problem can be solved. With that, I think we're going to have to come to an end because we're at the zero minutes left point, but I thank you very much. Very well done.